Okay, so basic plan is just to go through, provide a little bit of coherence to a couple of topics that have kind of come up. One uh, in particular is securitization, right? And that's a team that's, you know, somewhere between, I don't know, kind of banking, but also it's very much central stage to uh, derivatives, right? Um, Secondly, um, like to look at, you know, some kind of sense of uh, the credit crisis that occurred 2007. Okay, because there's links here, obviously, and then a little bit the regulation of derivatives. So what I would see really is there was a period of deregulation that came in the form of, you might recall, the ISDA, International Swaps Derivatives Association, which was kind of private law. And then you had the Commodity Futures Modernization Act of 2000, which was introduced the very last day Bill Clinton was in office. And it was sort of a thank you, right, to the bankers uh, on, on his way out. Okay, but uh, okay, let's first of all take a look at what securitization is, right? So we'll just try to briefly map out what securitize rep securitization represents. And we'll go to that flow chart that we had in, that's quite, you know, people use quite a lot. But the basic idea is if, if you look at the kind of uh, basic flow chart of securitization, it looks something like this, you have a bank Right, and the bank obviously is in the business of lending money. And you know, in a it's not uncommon to lend it to people who have mortgages. The very big debt that people take on very often is related to financing their mortgage. Right, uh, in return, what the bank gets when they lend is a commitment by the mortgagor to repay through amortized payments, uh, maybe over 20 year term. So, you might have a you know, in the US, it's not uncommon to have a 6% fixed 30-year uh, mortgage. Uh, you also have variable rate mortgages or floating rate mortgages. But this type of structure product is not that uncommon. It's actually quite typical. Uh, those mortgages, if you like, if you take think of a bank for a moment, and the balance sheet of a bank, when a bank lends money out, right, the mortgage is an asset to the bank. So it's on the asset side of the balance sheet. And, you know, they could lend out maybe a lot of money, like a hundred million dollars or something. But then somehow they got the fund it, which is coming in from the liability side. And then you, f you fund it by, you know, taking money from depositors. And maybe you're getting 90 million in the form of deposits and then the balance you're making up with funding coming in from shareholders. Okay, so the balance sheet always balances. So you might have something like that. And that's sort of a traditional, I don't know, the term you might use is traditional bank structure. Okay, but if we get back to securitization for a moment, you've the bank and it's lending money, right, to the to people who want to borrow funds, maybe to purchase their home. And the bank has, if you like, um, the security of the property. There's a, typically in a, in a mortgage, you have a lien, which means in the event of non-payment, the bank has a lien against the property. They can just swoop in, take the property and sell it. So it's a kind of, it's highly collateralized. So in many respects, it shouldn't be that risky, particularly if the loan to value rate is not too high, right? Now, uh, in a traditional bank, the more you lend, the more of these mortgages you have on your, your balance sheet. But that the issue then arises, uh, you've got to fund, right? Any money you lend out, you've got to fund it and you've got to take it in in a certain way. And you would like to take it in the form of deposits and maybe, uh, maybe issuing your own bonds. Uh, but there's gotta be some element of e equity as well. And in a, you know, in a conventional bank setting, 
you know, bank regulation typically means you've got to satisfy some kind of capital, right? So if you look at the, the BAL framework, there is some international accords, BAL 1, BAL 2, um, you know, BAL 3, and it may well be a BAL 4 now on its way. So these BALs keep iterating, right? Uh, with a BAL 4, BAL 3, Okay, come on. BAL3 and BAL4, right? Probably due to be implemented 2023. But these, these BAL frameworks, the original one basically set out a very simple structure where if you lend out uh, funding, you had to set aside a sort of 8% in the form of capital. And typically that meant you'd have 8% 8, 8 set aside in the form of equity. And there was some kind of allowance. It was we use the term risk weighted. So if there was any mitigation issues that allowed us to say, well, it's not a, lendy, a, a risky loan and that um, we could say there's collateral underpinning the loan, maybe we could make an adjustment, risk weighted, maybe divided by two. But banks were lent out money based on these agreements, international agreements uh, that date back a long way now, uh, have to set aside capital. And that that means the capitalists, in bankers jargon, they would say the capital is trapped. And if you're looking at, if you want one, if you want to understand why Ulster Bank is pulling out of the Republic of Ireland today, one of the reasons to cite is just the heavy capital charges associated with banking in Ireland. The risk is perceived to be higher Central bank demands a lot of this, a lot of capital. And the view is you got you get a better return on capital or, or equity somewhere else. So they're leaving, right? Banks don't like this heavy capital charges. Generally, it's not something they like. Uh, there is a solution, however, and that is you securitize, right? So a bank actually could, a bank could securitize its loan book now, what would that look like? Well, you could imagine a bank lends out all this money, right? And um, basically, um, you have, um, you know, maybe mortgage one, mortgage two, mortgage three. And as you're lending out funds, right, you have a stack of mortgages. And ideally, what you would like to do is, you know, just sell them, right. And the way you would sell them is you'd sell them to an SPV, right, a special purpose vehicle, right, SPV, special purpose, right, vehicle sounds like a four by four. Um, but it's not a sports, not an SUV, it's a special purpose vehicle. It just means that it, essentially what this boils down to is you have a separate entity that legally is different, Leg legally separate entity that is different from the bank. And so there's no, if something goes wrong, when the mortgage is transferred to the SPV, if there's defaults then in terms of the mortgages, right? then the SPV pick up the loss, not the bank. So you you basically, if you build up a stack of mortgages in terms of the, the balance sheets, you put them together. Maybe they all have a similar type of credit rating like Alt-A or a lower one would be subprime or the best mortgages might be prime. They may all have a particular categorization and a maturity and a credit risk that make them slightly uniform. And then what you would do is instead of having this structure where you've got to keep pumping equity, trapping capital on the balance sheet mandated by your central bank or Federal Reserve or ECB, you actually just sell the mortgages that you build up to an SPV. And then in turn, what they typically would do they would sell them on to investors, right? 
and the investors could be made up of different types of um, investment um, um, vehicles, right? So for instance, you might have amongst the investors, you might have hedge funds, you might have pension funds, you might have insurance companies. So basically, um, you know, uh, there could be a wide variety of different interested parties here. So you'd have typically uh, hedge funds, uh, you would have, you know, in the mix insurance companies, you would have, um, you know, people trying to manage pensions and so on. Could be, I mean, before the meltdown, what typically you're finding was, you know, a very uh, disaggregated type structure where maybe mortgages were being originated in Florida, they were being sold on to an SPV, could be in Dublin. Dublin was actually uh, a center, the Irish Stock Exchange for a period that was one of their main lines of business. The Irish Stock Exchange doesn't trade much by way of stocks. Actually, they're more, uh, you know, it's more fixed income issuance that they're involved with. And some of the stru structures they would have set up and made sure was, were legally compliant and so on um, involved uh, the mortgages coming from the US being set up and purchased by an SPV uh, established in Dublin. And then that SPV in turn selling those um, what we would call mortgage backed securities onto investors who would be, you know, hedge funds, insurance companies, pension funds. Now, typically, when you sell these mortgage-backed securities, which are new instruments, like they are not uh, the mortgages, if you like, they're payments. What we basically have here is that the, the payments that are coming through servicing the mortgages, this is a, an amortized payment that has both principal and interest uh, together, right? And it's flowing through. So these are cash flows that are flowing through and over here, you have investors and they, they pick up, they purchase mortgage-backed securities. And as a result, they get the principal and the interest associated with the mortgage-backed security. Typically, uh, investors like this, uh, they prefer if the instrument is highly rated. So in the past, typically what we have, we've observed here, you had to have a rating agency uh, in the process, right? because the rating agency, um, you know, with its, a magic wand, if you like, could give, so a, a Fitch, Moody's, S&P, right? So in the past, you would have had maybe Fitch, three big ones, but there are many more. Moody's, S&P would give a rating and the rating could vary, you know, triple A, double A, single A, investment grade B, and so on to unrate it, right? But the coveted rating is the triple A. And if you, if a mortgage-backed security could attract a triple A rating, then that meant that the insurance companies and the pension funds, these are natural, they have a natural appetite for investing in triple A rated paper. And very often they're also mandated because of regulation to invest in triple A rated paper, right? Um, and as a result, then that implies that uh, there was a big demand in this period, particularly before 2007, before the financial crisis kicked off, that the rating agencies came up with triple A rated paper, right? Now, these guys were often paid a fee, right? That's how it works. And if you give a triple A rating, then, you know, you have to be paid a fee. Any rating you give uh, requires a fee, but you know, all these rating agencies all worked on commission. In fact, everybody, the guys who were doing the securitizing, the structuring in Dublin, they were getting a fee. The mortgage brokers were getting a fee. Uh, when the mortgage brokers, uh, when the bank no longer was part of this process, they reverted to a sort of collection agent. They were getting a fee. And then the guys in the pension funds and so on, uh, they uh, typically got bonuses if you had high yield on an instrument and you you had a triple a rated instrument and there's better yielding than a government instrument then you know the in the pension fund managers and so on they also got bonuses everybody this type of structure 
were getting bonuses, fees and so on. And so it became a little bit fragmented, the whole process, right? Now, what securitization also allowed was the banks didn't have to go back again to our traditional banking structure, right? Our traditional balance sheet, if you like, right? If you could sell the mortgages this side, you could go off and get new money in through the mortgage-backed securities. Basically, the sale of the mortgage-backed securities, which in turn provided the SPV, would funding that then that money then went to the to the banks, who in turn then could lend again. Right. So the investors paid the SPV for the mortgage-backed securities. The SPV passed this on to the bank. The bank then could lend again, and so the cycle could continue and you weren't limited by the amount of equity that you had. You weren't constrained by equity here in this process. You could lend much bigger multiples based on the small amount of equity that you had. So this was a very attractive process to the banks. And of course, this became very popular in the 1990s on the back of, remember the Baal, first Baal Treaty was introduced in 1988. To, so to escape the Baal framework, right? Typically what was happening was the uh, banks were securitizing and the war traditional securitizers, you're familiar with them probably, you probably heard, have heard of, you know, the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, right? In this process, right? Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac instruments, right? And typically what they were doing was they're providing a credit enhancement uh, these were originally they were government owned, then government sponsored, then they were private entities. 2007, they were overexposed to the property market crash. And as a result, uh, they had to be taken into the term that they used was conservatorship. I don't know if you've seen that term. It is like nationalization. But in the US, they don't like using the term nationalization. That's what happens in Mexico when, you know, they government takes over the oil wells. So it's a sort of a dirty term, but conservatorship is a kind of nice term. And I think Brittany, Brittany Spears, people talk about freeing Brittany, what's she been freed from? Apparently the legal arrangements where her dad is in control of her finances and so on, that's also referred to conservatorship, right? So it is a nicer term, uh, obviously than, than um, the nationalization and also the idea would be with conservatorship the, that ownership would revert back to owners. Now, in the traditional type of securitization that took place, right, um, basically uh, in the process, right, and this is why Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were important, there was a guarantee. So there's this idea that there was a credit enhancement right and historically this credit enhancement was coming from again Fannie Mae and if you think of the history of the banking crisis the banking collapse in the 1930s in the US on the back of that um, in 1938 Fannie Mae was set up part of the new deal and the idea was to get money out to the bank so it could, could lend but to get confidence into the banking system you need guarantees and so basically Fannie Mae provided guarantee. So if we go back to the 1930s, this idea of securitization is not a brand new idea. It's not a financial innovation or financial wizardry that was invented in the 1980s, 1990s. This actually is quite an old idea. It goes back to the 1930s. And it just meant, look, there was a government sponsored agency who said, we promise if the mortgages default, which they do from time to time, when you have a property market collapse, the government will step in and make you good, give you a hundred cent in the dollar. Okay. Now by the 1990s, of course, Wall Street thought maybe we should do this and actually it was kind of a neat idea, right? And the credit enhancement that was coming, if it was a kind of private label securitization, rather than being public, there was private label securitization. And when that, private label uh, uh, credit enhancement came, it very often came in the form 
of what we call, and you might recall this, the credit default swap, right? Credit, let's get that down, credit, credit default swap. Okay, now just to give a quick overview of a credit default swap, right? Um, you could have A, A, and then you could have a, a bank, let's say AIG. Okay, and let's say A has some kind of exposure to Greek government bonds. And they're a little bit fearful that Greek government bonds could default, which happens from time to time, right? And then you have, you know, A is so concerned, in fact, what to say, look, uh, we will pay AIG 5%, maybe per annum, and in return, well, AIG won't pay anything. But if there's a default, maybe, and over the period of whatever, you know, there's a typically a maturity specified in these contracts, highly specified. In fact, a lot of these contracts, you know, will adhere to ISDA master agreements. ISDA here are a key part of the plumbing, the financial plumbing. And again, I, I will use this term private law right, private regulation, private agreements, but they have what we would call master agreements that everybody else tries to map into. It's sort of an efficient way of doing it. It's also a form of having private regulation as opposed to public. But the way the, the um, credit default swap, credit default swap is structured is that it's like any other swap. You pay something, you get something back but the something back from AIG, who was heavily involved in this market up to 2007, then also was, I believe, taken to conservatorship. The, the, uh, the bit that you pay back is based on what? If the reference asset defaults, that triggers AIG to having to pay in full whatever the losses. So basically, if Greek government bonds defaulted, they were trading at 20 cents in the dollar or in the euro, then AIG would pay A, I would pay A whoever the counterparty is, the, the balance. They would they'd give them 80 cents to make up uh, the full euro, uh, 100 cents in the euro. That's the idea. Now, if you looked at this for one moment, you would say, well, you know, there's, that there's a name for this. It's just basically insurance. But historically, uh, ISDA have always refuted this idea. It's not insurance, they would say. And largely that is because they don't want to be subject to any form of insurance regulation. So in the master agreements and so on, uh, that define many of the payments and what the trigger event is, no reference is ever made to insurance. That way you can avoid being subjected or that's a strategy to avoiding being subjected to um, regulation, right? Now go back to securitization for a moment. Uh, who might be here in the process? Well, we said Fannie Mae, right? Or Freddie Mac, but if it wasn't them, right? And in uh, late 2006, early 2007, many of the people involved here are sort of household names, but it might be Lehman or AIG or Goldman, Goldman Sachs, right? And uh, they provided, they were heavily involved. All were affected adversely by this. Lehman was wiped out. AIG was put into conservatorship. Goldman managed to survive uh, by selling it on to other entities, right? So Goldman was quite nimble and moved quicker and got rid of a lot of this junk paper, right? Before it became a problem. Now, credit default swaps are perfectly good, you know, financial contracts and they do a job, but they're closely associated with the overexpansion, the overheating of the property markets, okay? So you can imagine what happens in a traditional banking type system where you have a traditional balance sheet. There's, there's actually a speed limiter. You can only go at the speed of how much capital you set aside to back any lending out. If you lend money out, you've got to get the money in. 
in a securitization world, you can speed up the cycle and there's no speed limit. And that means you can lend out a lot more. So in this type of world, right, where you have the, the credit rating agencies, the Moody's, the S&P, the Fitch and so on, uh, quite willing to pick up fees for providing rating, Moody, S&P, Fitch, right? And that's not to blacken them too much. That's kind of, that's the incentives that they had in front of them pre-2007. You issue a rating, maybe a triple A rating, right? You collected a fee, you're getting a fee for the rating. And then you had insurance companies that said, we would like to buy this stuff, this paper, this mortgage-backed securities, because we're getting good yield. And if you have the triple A rating, then we abide by, we're in compliance with the regulation that's in vogue, right? So everybody's getting a little commission, a little fee. The mortgage broker is getting a couple of percent. The SPV is getting something, a lot of lawyers in this process, a lot of structurers, a lot of financial engineers, everybody's getting something. And then you have on the, the buy side, you have investors, uh, but the investors are being represented by, you know, there's managers on a fund. And if they perform well in a given year, the managers get commissions. If you get higher yield in government bonds, but have instruments that have the same rating as government bonds, that means you must be performing well. So they were also getting yield. The, the whole process here then contributed to an overheating in property markets, right? So that's something that we would have observed. And if you look at the Case-Shiller price index over the period, right? You can see that from about 1990, uh, 1999 to um, maybe 2007, the price has more than doubled, right? So house prices doubled, more than doubled in the period from the turn of you know, 2000 to 2007 in the US quadrupled in Ireland. Um, so this wasn't unusual or just unique to, to the United States, right? It's something that we're very familiar with in, in Ireland also, right? So th that's securitization. The problem with securitization uh, it has been, at least in the past, when every little bit is disaggregated, uh, we tend to have this problem, uh, very little skin in the game right? Maybe we might say no skin. And then also with insurance type contracts, there's always a tendency if you're selling, let's say earthquake insurance, you keep lowering your fees. I mean, uh, uh, if you have a, a one in a 10 year or one in a 20 year event, uh, where the payout only occurs at these, you know, uh, like if you're picking up fees, for a considerable period of time. And then maybe once every 20 years, once every 30 years, you have a housing crisis, right? That's what triggers a payment. You might start to under provision, you know, in a credit default swap type setup, there's a lot of incentive here that in competitive markets, you keep reducing this. So instead of picking up maybe 5%, you might say, oh, we're, we're happy with three. Or look, even better, we can do two. You know, you want to do a deal, if AIG has a London office a little bit away from, um, you know, headquarters in the US, you might have a, a rogue in the London office willing to underprice, picking up a lot of fees, maybe for 10 years or so on, but that's a lot of commissions to the, to the guys doing the deals. And there was a tendency that they underpriced insurance. And again, we've seen that also in Ireland, underpricing insurance, it, long term, it ends in disaster, but for the guys picking up the fees, doing the deals in the interim, it's very attractive, right? Okay, so we have this um, uh, MBS. This is one form of, you know, uh, securitization, and it involves a credit default swap, and that's a credit derivative. Uh, you also have another form of structure here. Not every payment that comes through here to the investor is on a pro rata basis. So if it's just a mortgage backed security, we might assume it's pro rata. But if, if the structure of the mortgage payment, so if, if we consider that payment between the SPV for a moment and the investor, and let's say you say to, to the investor, we realize that there's different markets here. We have the pension funds, we have insurance companies, and then we have maybe uh, people who are in the 
hedge fund side, they all have different appetites for risk. Maybe these guys have to go with triple A rated. Uh, maybe these guys can take a little bit more risk, maybe not. And the hedge fund guys can say, look, we don't even need a rating. We can buy whatever we want. So instead of doing a pro rata and you have a guarantee in the form of a credit default swap, another way of structuring this is to set up what's called a CDO, CDO, which is a collateralized debt obligation. And the idea of the collateralized debt obligation is that you basically, you tranche, right? The idea is you tranche or slice and dice uh, the payment. So uh, one way of thinking about that is, you know, you could think of uh, sort of cascading, you know, different pots and that, you know, the payment arrives in the form of, you know, funds that are being paid. So the SPV will pay funds and the guys that have the top rating, you know, uh, tranche, they get paid first. And only when these guys get paid, funds will find a way maybe to a lower tranche, equity or mezzanine, right? So you have these lower rated, maybe something that's double A rated, it gets paid next. And then you have unrated, which would be the equity tranche and they get paid, they get paid last. All right, so it's like a tap, you turn it on and then from the tap or the faucet, the funds go to these guys and then to these guys and then lastly to these and maybe we structure something like 80 percent and then 10 percent and 10 percent so you would have to burn through uh 10 percent of the mortgages before these guys are affected then you'd have to burn through another 10 percent before these guys are affected and that might look uh, like a, a quite a safe bet particularly if historically you know, mortgages were considered to be very safe. If the mortgages uh, in the pool were considered to be very safe, then uh, having a structure like that, a CDO structure was very safe. So that, that, that's a, that might be, we might refer to this as being a CDO. There was also CDO squares, right? Which would basically you took maybe some of this, maybe even paper that didn't have a rating, right? Maybe BBB or something or unrated equity tranche, but let's say just for sake of argument, it's BBB, and then you retranche that, right? And maybe you get somebody else's BBB tranche and you put that, and hopefully it's uncorrelated with this one and that gets put into the same pool. So you slice and dice more and then uh, you create with that then, you know, more AAA rated, more triple B, and then unrated. Uh, but this might be getting 60%, and this might be 20% of the pool, and this might be 20%. So you're, that the old adage, you know, sow's ear or the pig's ear, sow's ear, silk purse. This was, uh, you know, one of the byproducts of this type of structuring. That was very common, uh, you know, when we said, look, securitization represented a form of bank deregulation, right? And then what was fueling the bank deregulation was derivatives deregulation. So the story of the securitization in terms of its growth is linked heavily to discussion around the growth of derivatives. And on the, you know, the banking side, you had basically, if you look at the political context of the 1990s, we know the Clintons tried to introduce health reform, given the degree to which uh, segments of the American population are uncovered for health insurance. They tried to put through an Obamacare package. Hillary was at that point, uh, I think, uh, Secretary of Health. It didn't work out. Uh, the um, the houses uh, were set against it. They couldn't progress it. And then they looked for an alternative way of making society a little bit more equal. And they found themselves going towards um, home ownership. And strangely enough, most people in the US can agree about most political 
the key political uh, leaders um, so on are quite happy. There is a sort of consensus that home ownership is good. And that in the event of a, if you have your own home, uh, if you have a health event, if you're very sick, you need fund funding for some import from surgery, you don't have insurance, you could remortgage your home. Okay, so th this idea that the house became or the home became uh, a form of self insurance uh, took took on life. Um, both Republicans and Democrats could agree with that. And that kind of meant that the Clintons found themselves getting closer and closer to Wall Street and banking. And thus, you might understand why uh, Larry Summers and um, Rubin and people who were involved, who were close advisors to Clinton, were saying, look, these are solutions that you have and you can do through the banking system. And there was this idea, you know, the last day President Clinton was in office, he put through legislation for the Commodity Futures Modernization Act. This was in 2000, which basically meant that if you have insurance legislation or if you have bucket shop legislation that historically could have been applied to uh, derivatives, uh, it was made clear, the law became very clear, uh, uh, derivatives would not be subjected. So. For instance, credit default swaps and so on would not be subjected to either insurance regulation or bucket shop, regulate, bucket shop uh, legislation. There was always the risk that even though ISDA, the International Swaps and the Rift Association created these master contracts that were basically recognized in law as being private law, right? There was always the risk, a legal risk, that maybe a court might uh, make a judgment on these derivatives that look, no, actually a credit default swap is insurance and then it must be subjected to statewide uh, regulation in insurance and then in requiring higher degree of maybe capital, right? Uh, and uh, that was seen as unsavory. It was also seen that would put New York at a, a disadvantage compared to London. All the, the, the big financial hubs like London, Singapore, uh, you know, um, so on, Chicago, everybody was kind of competing, right? And if you create legal certainty or legal uncertainty, then you're putting your own financial hub at a disadvantage. So the view was Commodity Futures Modernization Act 2000 kind of cleared up that. And the Clinton saw the banking sector and the deregulation of the derivatives as being important for encouraging then this idea of home ownership, right? And making possible home ownership. That became a key uh, objective here. And it looked very pragmatic. It looked very sensible. But of course, what happened then in the interim was we had, if you like, um, we had the, I think we have it here. Can I get that? Um, the case Schiller. If we look at the Case Shiller price index, uh, house price index, um, you had this overshooting in the property market. Let's see if we can find that. It's normally, um, let's see, all come down, Federal Reserve of St. Louis. So Robert Schiller and uh, uh, a colleague came up with this idea of tracking house prices. But you can look at US house prices over the period uh, 1990, 2000. And what you see is this very rapid increase between the early 2000s and uh, 2006, 2007. You see that house prices uh, kept going up. Uh, I think the turning point there might be August 2006 right, a little bit after October 2006, and then they started to fall. So they more than doubled. If we take um, at this point here, that uh, in 2000, house price index sat at about 2000, at, at 100 base index, it went up then to 185. So it, it kind of, it, it almost doubled, right? If we go to pre, if we go to 1999, 
1998, it's 93. You can see how the prices doubled over that short period. In a 10 year span, prices doubled, uh, looking at this uh, case shield index, and then they fell. And then you had uh, a lot of uh, collateral damage in these big urban, um, you know, the Detroit and so on had a lot of issues. Vegas, uh, there was a lot of housing units that uh, just emptied out swimming pools that were unattended. That you had mosquito problems arising, um, and uh, it, this was very damaging. Uh, and so, in a sense, uh, securitization obviously was one of the uh, reasons why this occurred. Also, we can link in why securitization became very popular. Um, well, you had the Bell framework, right? And uh, this was international uh, agreements that all the the, the main um, jurisdictions uh, signed up for, and it basically meant more potential banking. But there was a back door, and the back door was securitization, and securitization meant you could escape. Uh, all that capital being trapped uh, by um, uh, th these risk-weighted buckets being applied to the banking system. Uh, the growth of securitization then uh, was fueled by regulatory arbitrage. It was also fueled by this inability uh, to get through health insurance. This is an old chestnut in the US. Uh, the alternative was one that everybody could basically agree, encourage home ownership. And uh, securitization then was associated with relaxation of lending standards, but also deregulation in the in the derivative market, a great reliance on credit default swaps as a form of uh, managing collateral, uh, which was uh, ultimately failed. Um, and then also the Commodity Future Modernization Act uh, was introduced in 2000. So this is the Wikipedia entry. And basically, you know, it goes through that, look, the, the, um, uh, it, it created legal certainty. So basically, uh, it's the United States um, legislation that ensured financial products known as over-the-counter derivatives remained unregulated. It was signed into law on December 21, 2000 by President Bill Clinton. It clarified the law. So most OTC derivative, transaction, uh, derivative transactions between sophisticated parties would not be regulated as futures under the Commodity Exchange Act of 1936 or as securities under federal securities law. Instead, the major dealers of those products, banks and security firms would continue to have their dealings in OTC derivatives supervised by their federal regulator under general safety and soundness standards. So you regulated the financial institutions, not the deal that allowed a sort of blind eye could be turned to this. Um, and uh, it meant uh, relaxation uh, of derivatives. Now, uh, if we follow on then in terms of, well, what then subsequently happened, the final chapter here, we might say once the you know, you had the financial crisis, 2011, 2007, 8, 9, 10, maybe spanning up to 2011, 2012, right? Um, there was a kind of a rethink and uh, Dodd-Frank was introduced in the US, right? Which was um, uh, Barney Frank and I think Chris Dodd, right? And both of them had a kind of pushed, this is interesting, uh, they both had pushed uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to lend more and to relax standards. Uh, but then after um, the excess uh, and the, the house burning down, then they, you know, they became the firemen, if you like. Um, so um, now that might be a bit harsh on them. Uh, okay, but uh, basically, they had to look at the plumbing and said, look, we require reform here. So their legislation came in 2010. Now, most of the provisions didn't actually apply to derivatives, but there was a section that did. And in there, they said, look, if you're going to trade these OTC, over-the-counter derivatives, right, uh, what you've got to do is trade uh, through a CCP, centralized counterparty. And so if you're entering into 
in future a credit default swap with an AIG. Okay, that's great. We encourage this activity. We encourage this financial innovation. We don't want to stymie financial innovation. And of course, everybody uh, usually wedded to having the, these financial hubs operate uh, without too much encumbrance. But as a basic measure, the trade should be exercised in such a way that a CCP would clear the deal. And that meant that they would set, they would have to determine the amount of margin that could be set aside. So the margin is the collateral that would be posted to make sure that in the event of a non-payment, uh, AIG would be covered. And you set up a margin account and then you mark to market the deal. Uh, that wasn't there before uh, 2010. And then this became mandated. So where possible, if an OTC deal could be uh, put through a centralized counterparty, then it would take this form. It also meant you moved away the structure from being uh, what we might say, um, instead of um, having bilateral type market infrastructure, bilateral, let's just, yeah, instead of having a bilateral, bilateral would be a structure like this, that if you have A, B, C, D as counterparties, you deal with B and then A deals with C. So everybody's talking to everybody, but nobody has an overall view about what's going on. The deals are being made, but they're bilateral deals. And the problem is if there is difficulties with B, uh, not everybody knows. You only know, C only knows the bit of the conversation that they're having, D only knows the conversation they're having would be nobody quite knows and the central bank or the Federal Reserve doesn't have an overall picture. So the idea of a CCP would be uh, you, with a CCP, you basically, everything must be executed. So A, B, C, D, if they're counterparties, it's a, the CCP stands in between. Then if there's problems in the market, Federal Reserve, they know where to go to look to see, investigate where the problems are. Okay, that's kind of a summary then of some of the issues that have arisen in terms of securitization, the credit crisis, uh, banking, banking deregulation, derivatives, derivatives deregulation, credit default swaps, the financial crisis, the re-regulation, the movement away from traditional banking to securitization, the growth of credit derivatives in the form of CDOs, CDSs, the, the, um, the financial engineering around uh, CDOs that you slice and dice, that you're tranching, right? All this tranching was something that was uh, relatively new. Then in the aftermath of the financial crisis, what to do, uh, you had, um, you had, uh, in the early 2000s, you had uh, ISDA and CFMA as being kind of the regulatory kind of landscape. And then how that switched then uh, after the crisis to take on board Dodd-Frank, which was basically, look, we've got to, to set out uh, centralized counterparties and they must act as the clearinghouse on the deals and then they know what's going on and they know if there's adequate capital supporting the deals and then we moved from bilateral right bilateral type market infrastructure which was found to be flawed to this centralized right market infrastructure kind of bespoke market infrastructure okay so um let's leave that let's leave that there <laughs>